So this is actually uh, actually one long session, and um, uh, it's something I'll talk to the program committee next time and say, okay, when we do these back to back, where it's actually one long session, so we'll figure out how to do something with it. So you guys are all coming into um, um, the it says service card security toolkit book. So this is a security oriented session. Um, and I'll walk through just as a review so people will get an idea of, of what, what we're talking about here. So how many people here, just count of hands, how many people are brand new to NetOps? New, new, new people. We've got some yay. Good, this is good. We've got a lot of new people. We're trying to get more and more new people coming in on. Um, my name is Barry Green. Um, I've been around in the community for a long, long time. Uh, my background goes where I started on the ARPANET and or actually the PDN network when I was in the Air Force in the 80s. Um, got out of the Air Force in 89 and my next door neighbor said, why don't you come over and keep on working on the internet thing? And then I kept on working on the internet thing as a temporary job for quite a while and then it kind of grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, I was fortunate, I've been lucky. Um, got to work at some good research labs, really good people over the years. Uh, got to build service butter in Southeast Asia at Central Telecom. Worked for 12 years at Cisco Systems. That was the chief service butter security architect guy, worked on technology and net load and SFLP apps, things like that, chief technology to work with. Went to Juniper. Uh, was the, the director of the security and response team over there for three years. Um, great place. You know, I love the open source code and the Juno code and things like that with it. Um, and now working for Internet System Consortium. Came, went there originally to do security work, um, to do what I'm doing now, but I had to delay it a year because uh, Paul Mixie and I, as you know, Paul Mixie and DNS and things like that, that's ISC, uh, he and I swapped roles, so I'm now president, and so I had to help conduct and making sure ISC is a nice, stable, sound position with VR, and now we're doing all sorts of different projects. So ISC would do things, you know, it's combined, and this, what I'm, we're doing here is curriculum around service for our security, which we're building up. We were asked to do, uh, my colleague who was just here, Medica Kale, uh, blonde is in here, she, um, she just left. <laughs> where, is, where is she at? <laughs> I knew her for years. Yes. I've seen her very little. Yeah, so uh, um, she's around, so she, she, she'll be at the uh, after party tonight and stuff like that. Okay. Um, she was the one who taught me how to do access slips to protect uh, routers years ago. You know, I was, how do I config, how do I protect my network? You know, and, and, and I called Cisco and she was the one I called at Cisco and said, here's how you protect your network. So she started teaching me network security on routers years ago. Um, so, um, what we covered already, we covered threat vectors, we covered why security is important. Uh, we covered where all of you who are um, not doing security in your backbones today are probably going to be in a situation quite soon where your boss is going to say, we have to do something. So you're jumping right in the middle of the session. Um, I'm going to be going to a, a talk, uh, kind of like a, why I think the world was going to really change in 2012. So give me some context, so I'll fill in some of the blanks for, for you to check out. And then uh, we're going to swap over to sinkhole. So I'll talk a little, you know, if you just missed the section on uh, remote trigger black holes and source based remote trigger black holes, don't worry, this is tape. And there's, there's officially going to be tape sessions on it. And if you're really interested in any of this stuff, as I open it up, um, I'm recruiting people. So any of you who have things on your network and you're interested in deploying any security technique, you can come and talk to me and it will help work with you. Um, any of you who are exploring interest in security problems and you're looking for advice, come talk to me, right? And we'll work with you. Um, the materials that I'm presenting here are all open, right? So in other words, um, I'll point out here in a few minutes, um, you know, the URL, basically it's confluence.isc.org. You go to that site, you look for the space, for confluence space for SC security, and all the PowerPoints are going to be there. I'll load up the PDFs later on. For those of you who are like anti-Microsoft, I'll load up the PDFs. But what's the source there? So any of the stuff you see out here, you say, hey, I like the slide that Barry did. I want to use that to convince my boss that we should do this technique. Take the slide, pull it into your slide presentation, and you can look really good in front of your boss. 
to convince them that we need to do this at least. Sometimes I tell people that the best thing that I can do for the industry is to create PowerPoint slides for very brilliant engineers who can't do PowerPoint slides. Um, and it works quite, quite effectively with that. So anytime, ask questions um, and with it. And so we'll try to catch up uh, everybody who's new. So now, one of the things you missed is I walked through a, a whole scenario talking about how the bad guys go out there and basically they can, they can own our network. We're living in a situation right now which is pretty, a lot of people are pessimistic because if an antivirus doesn't work anymore like they think it's gonna work, the you know, operating systems, even though you got brand new operating systems that have the one security zone life cycle, the business broken into, Macs are now being targeted by criminals because there's a lot of money behind it. There's a lot of money for criminals to make a lot of money off of it when they're going after the target system. Everybody here in this room, I can tell you right now, probably have systems that are infected and you probably don't know about it, or you may know about it and you don't know what to do about it. You know, they get infected all the time with it. That's just the way the, the ecosystem works. But, as I was asked to do uh, uh, several weeks ago at this uh, conference that had a whole bunch of law enforcement people, the um, uh, Internet Crimes Consortium meeting in uh, Fordham University in New York, they asked me to do this keynote and say, what do I think the future is gonna look like? 2012, I think, is an in, in inflection point. I'm gonna talk about why and talk about some of the community and talk about why you here is one of the reasons why I think 2012 is going to be when we look back 10 years from now is the, is the year where things start turning around we start pushing against the current criminals uh, and really protecting our infrastructure. So the key thing is private industry. Here in this room at this conference, because of simple things as, you know, I'm here on the badge. It's not black. I got a complaint now about that. It's supposed to be black dot, <laughs> but it's a blue dot, right? So, those of you who are new to Nanog, there's you go up to the site, you go up to the front there registration, and there's these three dots, and these are important because we glue the internet together with people, all of us here, who figure out how to interconnect and, and work with each other. That's why you come here. That's one. Of the, it's not just attend these sessions. You know, I tell people that come to Net, they come to Nano, so I'm going to hear sessions. I said, no, no, no. You don't go to Nano to watch sessions. It's all paid. You can watch the sessions online. You come to Nano to meet your peers. These are cool. The blue dot for this side is security. So those of you who are interested in security, you hear my talk, you can kind of find other people, other peers. Get the dot on your badge. If you see somebody, it says, like, yo, Eddie here. It says, okay, Eddie from Clearwater. Hey, I haven't met Eddie. All right, he's a security guy. We gotta exchange cards. So now, now I'm the Clearwater guy. So I gotta get his card and say, you know, and do something as simple as say, okay, you know, <laughs> so I know where you are, right? <clears throat> so I got a security guy now. This is now the blue, the green dot, BGP parent, right? I now work for 1280 ISC. We want to peer with you, <laughs> right? Come here with us, right? Uh, Keith Mitchell, who. Runs my uh, network engineer, he's running around, and he's got just the green dot, so it's here. The red dot, PGP key. Because sometimes we have to do security stuff where we have to go encrypt it, right? So if you want to sit down and we do a key exchange, let's do the key exchange and find each, find each other's key, right? This right here is critical, but, and this is what we talked about in the private industry really doing a turnaround in an industry because of things that happen here in, in, at Nanog where we, as peers, get to know each other and start working with each other. This has been going on for over a decade now from, from a network security standpoint. It's been making now big differences. We are now coordinating and collaborating with each other on the industry in a way it's never before. Uh, the domain change or collaboration, which is a whole bunch of service providers working together on the, this particular piece of malware and taking it down, is a big industry collaboration. 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had that sort of collaboration. Today, we're having that collaboration with the FBI and, and knocking down a gang in Estonia who ran a whole colo operation. They had a whole offices and everything. Rogue Digital was like, like any other colo. So the whole operation was set up for doing criminal activity. Right? And that was an industry effort taking it down. So this is the sort of thing that's, that's, that's changing things around. When you meet each other, we start working with each other and we start creating group reports. Let's start creating malware. Right? And I'll talk a bit about this with the operational security community where these groups start getting together and we start specializing. 10 years ago when we start first doing how to protect our backbone, 
So back in 2000, it was, everything was all on one web. Now we specialize. Like for instance, NSPSEC talks about backbone security. YASML, II are groups that focus on, let's take the piece of malware, new piece of malware comes across, and anybody who does malware research is on that list, and they start ripping the malware apart and figure out what that malware does, what are the bad guys doing with it, okay? Um, the DNS horror, protect DNS. Anything that happens to DNS, that's what you need to fix that. Next domain, here's a domain that the bad guy is using, Let's get it removed from all the registrars and registries that take care of that, all right? Um, so we specialize across here, right? And there's this group, OPSEC Trust, that actually is a kind of like a Facebook for the good guys, where we can actually create teams to investigate Torquay and Zeus and, you know, you know, name them now or there's some team working on it within the inside the industry to investigate what's going on with it. We can do it with encrypted wikis, exchange tools, with information being shared that uh, plus people out. You know, saying, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't know that you guys shared this level of details of information of, of each other's, what's going on in each other's network. What that's having an impact with is it's allowing us to actually make big differences. And these big differences is why I think that oh, this is going to be a turnaround here. And all of you guys are part of this, where, you know, there's a, there's a strategy of the action because, you know, all these different hours that we're actually making a success with is, is, is a core, is, is, is making a difference. So, one, this private-to-private -private collaboration going on here is increased. In other words, you, everybody here, there's a public-private partnership. Isn't it public-private partnership? You know, you hear these policymakers, you need public-private partnership. That doesn't really work. What works is what's going on in here. This is private-private collaboration. This works, all right? Eddie and I met each other. Something happens on this network, he calls me up, hey, I need some help. Hey, let's work with each other. Let's get that network back up and running. That's private private collaboration. That works. All right? Then, if we need law enforcement, say, hey, whoever did this to your network, Eddie, let's go after them. Hey, let's call a law enforcement buddy. Let's call somebody at FBI. Let's go after these guys. Then, we start working with the public sector. All right? And this model is the model that's now, you know, really pushing out in all parts of the world and it's having a difference with, with the work with it. So, so these activities, you know, um, is, you know, really making a big difference. Um, the technologies we talk about in this session, the one we talked about before this, and the one we'll talk about here in a minute, um, are really panning out and making a difference. In other words, it's not one of those things that say, I can't do anything to protect my network. We know what to do to protect networks. And they're not hard and they're not expensive. Like for instance, um, just before this, we talked about remote trigger black hole. Okay, now those of you here in the first session, how much do you think it costs to do remote trigger black hole and deploy it across the network? Okay, let's see. Well, step one, let me configure static routes on all my routers. Okay, how much did that cost you? I configure static routes on all my routers. Okay, there's no capital cost there. All right, step two, I have to configure a trigger router. That could be a spare router, it could be Quagga, or I can use an existing router on my network. How much that cost you? <laughs> Not much, all right? And if I wanted to configure it for routing traffic into a sinkhole, what's that cost? Probably spare gear. In other words, the techniques that we use to actually lock down a secure network are not capital intensive, but they work. They work quite quite well in helping affect the back networks and preparing prepare toolkit with it. So, so it's not a matter of we don't have tools. We have the tools for detecting, for tracking, and mitigating what's going on with the bad guys, all right? Um, how many people here get reports from different agencies on how many infections on the network? Anybody get reports from people? Team Cymru, Shadow Server, you know, groups like that? We'll talk about that. You can get these reports. They don't cost you anything. Shadow Server, Heat Shield will send you reports. No cost. We know, we know what, com what computers on the network are getting infected because people are watching in a launcher and they'll send it to you in a list for free, right? So the existing technologies for remediation have, have, have also, we'll talk about here towards the end, um, how do we remediate off of the ne uh, off a network. In other words, when your customers get infected, how do we clean it up? Um, then um, action. So when you guys, um, anybody here, what? If, if your network is attacked, you guys do anything outside of protecting the network? In other words, 
one of the things we're asking people to do is not just let me protect my network, but actually do something beyond that. Like work with your peers, search chances of malware, attack the malware, like take take it down. Attack the malware is like here's here's a botnet controller, find a botnet controller, and and then remove the botnet controller from the net. This sort of action actually makes a big difference. If somebody touches your network and, and attacks your network, attacks your customers, then um, you know, sitting there and just responding to it, you know, those days are actually aggravating. And it, it, it makes it even more so with the guys like Anonymous. Guys like Anonymous, you know, if you just let them hit you and you don't kind of like just dismantle their infrastructure, they'll hit you again and hit you again. They get bold with it. Um, effective collaboration, I'll dive into this in, in a session on what the offset op trusts and groups like that with it, but this is going to have a big impact with it. And then um, this is something that, thanks to Microsoft, um, is really panning out in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, there were several of us a couple of years ago who said, if somebody touches my network, um, instead of just allowing them, you know, just to run rampant with that physically piece of malware, um, let's do something about it, not with the law enforcement agencies, but in the civil courts. In other words, if I have lawyers working for me, and those lawyers know how to litigate and take something to court, and I can identify, say, here's an asset. So I say, okay, here's a computer asset. This, this is a computer asset being used for malware, right? And with that, that malware, you know, it's in some hosting center. So say, I don't want to pick on you, but say it's in your hosting center. These are low up so say it's your hosting center, right? And instead of just saying, you know, um, hey, um, can you take it down, right? And then the guy would go away. Instead, I say, okay, let me go to court and say, here's all these computers in his hosting center, and his hosting center, here's the hosting center, here's the hosting center. Here's all the computers. And you go to court and say, these computers are part of the terminal lane, and they're being controlled by John Doe. I don't know who John Doe is, but he's controlled by John Doe. And we want to confiscate all these because all these computers together cause my network damage. Here's how much damage it's causing. So I'm suing John Doe. I'm suing John Doe for damages because John Doe caused my network damage, right? And here's all his assets, okay? And until John Doe comes forward, I want to confiscate his assets. Right? What about the case where it's owned by a hosting provider? If it's owned by a hosting provider, a hosting provider has to say either they've been violated and then they have to clean it up, or um, if the bad guy buys it, because a lot of times that bad guy buys it, then the hosting provider has to give up the account. So now the account, instead of owned by John Doe, the account is now owned by me, that I just sued. So now I had access to that computer. I had access to all the forensic information. All right? This is exactly what Deutsche Microsoft did with Wallet X. Right? They went to a hosting provider and said, here's my court order. The court judge says, yes, here's the court order. Walks to the hosting provider, says, this computer that's been violated, I now own until John Doe shows up. Now, of course, John Doe, is he going to show up and walk into US soil and show up and say, hey, Microsoft can't steal my computer. I paid for that computer. Microsoft says, oh, sure, good, here, here's all. Let's take you to court, right? Let's take your passport away. There's a flight risk now, right? That sort of, sort of thing going on with it. So this sort of civil action is Microsoft started this, and we're going to be trying to get other companies to do the same sort of thing with it. And what that will do is cause a really pain in the butt for cyber criminals. Very interesting sort of stuff with it. So some of the case studies you see with Microsoft with it. Um, the other thing, and um, Sandy's not here, but Sandy just asked me about AS path filtering. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but you will know this later on in the year when we start writing up the paper for you. Here's how you can take BGP and have total control of who you talk to on the net. So if you, there's some hosting provider sitting in some country out there, and it's a source of spam, and the spam is coming on your network, and the spam costs you money. Because that spam comes in there, you have to process it and drop it. You have to send resources and computer capacity to filter that spam. So it costs you money. And you can say, I don't want this traffic. I wish this traffic would go away. It's all coming from this particular colo on this particular kind of system number. I wish I could just filter it. Well, guess what? You can filter it. BGP allows me to pull out and not have anything coming to it from that particular kind of system. You can filter that based off of the common system. 
capability from Juniper and Cisco Router to do that. You have an autonomous system yourself control over, I don't want to talk to, you're, you're the bad guy, Gaius, I don't want to talk to you at all. Even though you're four hops away in the AF path, I can still set up my VVP expressions, whether it's a Cisco, Juniper, or, or Lucent, Acatel, right? I can set them to tell you to do that. We're going to be teaching people how to do this this year. In other words, part of this material that we're resuscitating here with this session and further sessions, you can probably see, if not next now, then the next well, after that, we'll have a session in a regular nano session. Here's how you actually protect yourself with those sorts of techniques. Here's the different configurations of different vendors. Here's how they work. Here's the lab how to do this. And then you have another tool in your toolkit and say, um, here's a service provider in Turkey or Romania or in Vietnam and they are all colo taken over by bad guys and I don't want to talk to them anymore and you can filter them. That's going to cause a monkey wrench for bad guys. So in other words, all these things add up where we can go to when we push against it. Um, Real-time forensic data sharing is one of the projects that IACC works on where um, we're able to take like the DNS changer, which you'll hear about um, in a couple of sessions this week in the lightning talk, um, that we were able to go through and take over the bad guy, the road digital DNS servers, and put our servers there, so we put clean DNS servers, and then set up the filters and have the actual list of here's who's like infected, because they're all coming to those DNS servers, and feed that out. In other words, it comes in from a particular, in this case, it wasn't a sinkhole, it was coming into from the DNS servers, into a um, SIE exchange, and then out where Shadow Service in Hungary and a whole bunch of organizations got the feed uh, within minutes. As soon as the feed went in there, it was flooded out. So in other words, we're, we've figured out how to actually peer with each other with security data sets. Where we're peering with each other with passive DNS data sets and malware data sets, right? And basically um, share this information so we get a collective vision, a collective view of what's happening with that guy. All right, because if you have a view of the bad guys, and you have a view of the bad guys, you have a view of the bad guys, it's a fragmented data set. We all put it together where we can share with each other and peer with each other. Now all three of you have a better idea what the bad guy is doing. And we have an idea what the bad guys are doing, and we go out there and do something about it. Whether it's you know, filtering them, stopping them, pulling out their infrastructure, or in, in, in a lot of cases, putting handcuffs on them, working with law enforcement, putting handcuffs on, on them, right? Um, probably the most impactful thing happening this year, and this is why I think these sessions and why I'm kind of starting resuscitating these materials again, is um, 2012 is going to be the year where we're going to have more of the quantification of the risk. Behind the scenes for years, a year and a half ago, we took down this game that was used in Zeus. It was a variant game called Zeus Petrovich game. Zeus Petrovich per week, per week, we we're tracking 15 to 20 million dollars of theft per week. The game was in operation for over a year. 15 to 20 million dollars of theft out of personal bank accounts. This is one game with one cyber criminal cloud infrastructure. So behind the scenes, when you get in and, and, and start doing the investigation and seeing the money being stolen, the loss in, in civic society being happened. And these guys are smart. Uh, I gave an example of how smart they were. Like, um, these guys would figure out the acceptable loss threshold and where the trigger points were. So there was a case I gave in the last session where my wife's credit card got hit by a card, the card group. The card group were basically the secret shopper group and say, okay, they, they stole my wife's credit card. And they say, okay, um, here, you're a teenager and this is a crew in Miami. And here's, here's your, your wife's credit card, which is my wife's credit card. And here's the shopping list. And you're going around the stores you buy with that credit card, okay? And the shopping list had to be exact. It tells you exactly which merchandise to buy. Because what you would do is you would then bring all the merchandise back to me, and I'd give you a cut of the money. So I'd give you, pay you $200 to do that for the day. And I'd take all the merchandise and send it over to a shipper. The shipper sends it to uh, Nigeria. Nigeria then sells on the back market, and there's this whole scheme that goes on. But, um, the hit was $4,999 exactly. It was a Chase card, and Chase at the time only starts, only clocks down the card at $5,000 of theft. Okay? The stores that were hit were six different stores with six different insurance agents. 
And this is what's key. This is something I didn't talk last time. The other thing I found in that investigation, six different insurance agents. That means what they were doing is the criminals were spreading out the risk across the insurance agents. So the insurance agents couldn't total up the total amount of crime happening. What happened with this one survey that Norton put together, Samantha Norton, when they did a survey, they started figuring out how much crime. When they're talking about, you know, two hundred billion dollars of crime or cyber crime, when we're in that much range and they're starting to count it, then insurance agencies, your insurance agencies, start waking up and say, wait a minute, we're insuring these networks. Is this how much stuff is out there? Things start kicking in. In other words, the capitalism has a risk system set up, right? That risk system is a carefully balanced system to balance out the risk. And certain forces right now, they couldn't count the cybercrime theft to the society. This year is where the year where we start really counting in a granular way, in a public way. And what that's going to do is that, you know, a year from now, you're going to have your bosses come down and say, so what are we doing about security? So says, well, why are you asking? I never asked him before. I says, well, the insurance agents want a report. Otherwise, you're not going to insure us. What are we doing about security? All right? And that's part of putting these, these materials together so that way you can go back to them and say, well, here's all the things we're doing to reduce the risk to our network um, with it. The, another thing we're doing is taking back DNS. Did you know, guys, that the bad guys hide behind DNS? Just hide behind it. Because they can lock down the zone files. So I go out there and get a whole bunch of DNS names and just hide behind it. So what you guys get is you get an email coming in your spam, and I, I got a domain name, it's a really strange domain name from Romania or something, and you know that tomorrow he'll use a different domain name. I wish I knew what that domain name would be tomorrow. Well, did you know we can actually find that domain name now? All right? We're taking back DNS with Path to DNS, all right? So this is something, there was a lightning talk I did uh, two nanogs ago. We'll do a lightning talk on the next nanog. And this is a tool that anybody here, everybody here who is an operator, if you're looking for a forensics tool so you can see what the, what's going on behind the bad guys, come see me. We have authorization where we can get you a path to DNS account so you can check that out and you can see, wow, I can start seeing it. And if you're interested in seeing this path to DNS data into the community, it, it allows, basically allows us to go through and take one domain name and see exactly what they're doing. We can rebuild zone files. Take one domain name that the guy is using, and you can go to the name server and figure out every single one that's going on in there. So you basically spam house and servos get getting richer lists and are black holing whole ranges of domains that have the criminal kind of use it. We're taking back the DNS from the bad guys where they can't use it like they're using it right now to, to just go out there and do their crime. So all these sort of things kind of build up a, a positive approach. There's a lot of pessimism that we've had over the last couple of years. Cyber criminal crime has been growing, 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 but what we're seeing is this, this year is going to probably be one of the watershed years where we're turning things around with it. Um, DNS Changer is probably one of those core things with it. So um, how many people here have heard of DNS Changer? Know what it is? I'll tell you, this is, this is pretty, <laughs> there will be a lightning talk on it. DNS Changer. Um, this was a criminal gang that basically um, wrote digital with a colo in Estonia. Their criminal operandi is to get malware onto a computer and set, and they take control of their DNS. So in other words, instead of having the customer or the end user go to uh, the regular service provider DNS servers, it went to their DNS servers. So then when they go out there and somebody browses and goes like to Amazon, it would do ad insertions and basically it would set up a man in the middle and then put you know criminal ads and malware advertisements and things like that into it. Yes. Was that DNS changer, was, it, was that the one that caused the Department of Justice to send out that totally bizarre email that made no sense? Yes, that's okay. the one. Okay. That was a big embarrassment for the FBI because the FBI is one of it. Yes, that's the one in an hour discussion that was from that, the victim notification letter. Yeah. That used data, they used the wrong data set. Okay. Um, because what they used is they used a wiretap that they did off of a VPN and they got the VPN for the entire colo versus just what was going on with the DNS stuff. And so they were sending letters out to some, you know, it was, okay. FBI admit that that was a mistake. And they're learning from it, right? But it was actually a big industry collaboration that allowed it to happen. So, so um, things that, there'll be more like that. We're having good successful case now. The key thing with that one is that colo 
is shut down and the people will all be there. Right? And they will be prosecuted as you move over here to the United States and prosecuted in the United States. Right? So we're able to actually trace things back down where you talk about how do we do international criminal prosecution? We're learning how to do international criminal prosecution. So while that rogue digital, the domain changer, the FBI victim notification letter was all screwed up, we put the handcuffs on people and they will be prosecuted. Right? So this is where the action part comes in. We are learning how to do this. Right? Uh, but it starts here with private industry. So let me pop up get my next session here. And what I'm going to do We have so many new people, and this would be sorry for the guys who were here the first session. I'm going to do a quick run through so we put this in context before I rethink it. All right. So, over time, since the year 2000, when the service provider community started getting together and said we had to figure out how to protect ourselves, right? Certain techniques, like a toolkit of techniques, approach. So, the approach we use to protect our backbones is not to say that there's one solution, do it, because there is no one solution. And the range of backbones we have in here is everything from cloud providers to big banks to uh, service providers that are residential oriented to cell phone providers. We have a whole range of networks. So no one tool is going to protect everybody. And we as engineers have to do engineering. We have to engineer our network, right? So we take these toolkits and we apply it inside an engineering network. So these techniques, um, and I'll walk through these, right? Um, first thing we got to do is preparation. We got to prepare. My network operation center. We gotta do what you guys are doing here right now is prepare. Right? You can't wait until, you know, pardon the English, you know, shit hits the fan and and, and and then start preparation. It's too late then, right? So planning ahead of time and doing something. And you'd be amazed how, how a little bit goes a long way. So that's the first phase we talk about of the principles. Second thing is the collaboration. I talked about it here with the you know the the uh, the dot on the badge and getting to know people. This is probably the most powerful technique where you get to know your peers and work with your peers. You'd be amazed how many times the internet has been saved because a whole bunch of competitors got together on a conference call and started working with each other to save the net. All right? Really, really critical to know, 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 know um, you know, get to work with your peers with it. And then come up with tools with it to do it, whether it's uh, you know, private lists, out the trust portals, INOC VA, you know, you invest in your peer connections. Right? I'll come in the nano. I'm gonna write. Right? You know, your bosses are saying, well, why am I going? Why why, why should you go? I mean, how many people here had to had to really argue with your boss to come here? Right? <laughs> Hands come up, right? You gotta tell your boss that says, if we don't come here and we don't invest in your peers, then something's gonna happen in the network and I'm not gonna know the right people to call to actually keep our network up and running. And that is a true statement. That's a true statement. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of times that that's the path of ways. You got to invest in it. You got to work on your own network to make sure your network is locked down and protected. And some of the techniques to do this are not hard, are not uh, you know complicated. The example I gave in the last session was uh, a tool that CNN used back in the year 2000, which is take VPY access lists and put log files on it, and you put it into syslog. So then you take all my router devices, all my switch devices. And I take you know, the VPY access list, so if I get the scan, I log the scans in syslog. And then what they did in 2000 is they put it into MRTG and had a graph. So every day they got to see across the network all the scans hitting their port, right? And they got a threshold. And every day they had a threshold. And then uh, a, a month before the elections in 2000, it spiked up really high, which told them that somebody's really paying attention to my network. Maybe we should prepare. We're probably going to get attacked in the election. And they prepared. And they were able to keep the network up and running. CNN kept the network up and running because they saw that they were going to get attacked. Now, what did that cost them? VPY access list, syslog, which they were doing anyways, put a script in the syslog, throw it in MRTG. The only capital cost was spare servers to be used to process the MRTG and produce the graph. 
right? So some of the techniques we use to protect ourselves um, are not expensive techniques to do, all right? Same thing with edge protection. Edge protection is the core core principle, right? And edge protection ranges, right? It could be everything from using um, BGP to filter, to be using um, you know the IGP separation. You know, there's a reason why there's a lot of backbones out there use IS ISs or IGPs from a security standpoint because it is not IP, right? So you have BGP, which is IP, and you have IS IS, which is not IP, and it's a way of actually keeping ships in the night and keeping two protocols from doing it's part of edge protection. And some people, wait a minute, I'm talking about my circle layer. How's it edge protection? Well, it's edge protection because you can have a bunch of routes in your IGP, which it can't be attacked from outside. So edge protection for this stuff. So this is where in, in service fire security, we think things are a little bit different from just like filters on the edge. We do use filters on, on the edge, but we can also use the protocol itself to protect ourselves. Remember to trigger black hole. It's the number one tool that we use to actually protect the backbones out there. Um, this, we got a whole bunch of new people here. How many people here have remote, remote trigger black hole configured in your network today? All right, so some of you should be looking at the tape on the follow through with this. But this is a technique where I got over here in my NOC, I have a little trigger router, and I get a attack going on in my network, all right? And I'm gonna go through and use a one, one BGP advertisement, and then on the edge of my network, I felt the attack coming in. So this allows me to use BGP to actually drop an attack going towards a destination that's on my network. So if I have a customer who's getting hit with a DOS attack, and that DOS attack is causing collateral damage on everywhere in my network, instead of allowing the packet all to flow into my network, into my backbone, and hit the customer, I can use remote trigger black hole and move that customer's advertisement and null zero out to the edge of my network. So I just lessen the intensity of the attack by pushing it out. The customer's still under attack, but now my collateral damage is eliminated. All right, now what that costs me to do? A static route on every router, a trigger router on the edge. It doesn't cost me a lot to do. So a lot of these techniques, again, are not capital intensive. Uh, because we would create them in an environment where you as engineers and we would work with each other and you wouldn't have money in your budget for security. So we have to figure out how can we use whatever's in our network today to make the network more secure. And that's where a lot of these techniques came up. This is the next section I'm gonna talk about with the sinkholes and sinkholes, I'll just get to that session next after we get through it. Um, another part of the principles is uh, uh, ingress packet filtering, BGP38. Source addresses coming into your network should belong to your customers, nobody else's, right? And there's a bunch of different techniques that you would use to actually filter. So it's not just unique SRCF or HDLs. You know, there's also IP source verify and a couple other tools out there that you can do. BCP least query, for example. BGP prefix filtering. There's a bunch of techniques you can use today to keep protect your BGP and your control plane. You don't have to sit there and say, well, I'm waiting for BGP security to come out for the new protocol. Don't wait. There's things you need to do on your network today to help protect your tunnel system to make sure you know your cable doesn't get trapped. You know, um, a a router in your roof crane can take out Sweden. Okay, that happened when I was at Juniper. A router in your crane took out Sweden, right? With one BGP advertising, right? Because the filter wasn't actually explicit like it should be explicit, right? That's you know it happened to be a vulnerability. But you know that's the sort of things that you have to you know watch out for. Total visibility. If you're a telco in the old school, the, uh, understanding what's happening to your customers is critical to your business. And this goes for everybody. That same visibility toolkit, understanding what's happening to your customer, can be used to understand what's happening from a security standpoint. Right. So total visibility is, is key. Um, one of the first things they did when I came from Singular Telecom into Cisco Systems is they're getting ready to kill NetFlow. How many people here use NetFlow? Yay, so you're welcome, I say. <laughs> um, because I was very, very, you know, I'm a big statistics person. I love that, you know, I go, we can't stop this. And the reason I came to Cisco Systems to stop it, to being killed, was because of the business necessity that product managers need to understand what was happening to customers. It had nothing to do with security. Had nothing to do with security, but I bet all of you are kind of looking at it for security reasons, 
but it had nothing to do with the security. That's not when the, you know, it was, security came later. Security was like, oh wow, hey, we can use it for security. But the reason it was saved inside this Cisco, and the reason why it was integrated with, with SAP, and the reason why we took it out and did the whole you know, open source with the C-Flow tables and things like that, and the different partners, was to keep it you know, from, a, from a product manager perspective. We wanted to know what's going on on your network, right? So that was, that was um, um, that's an example, right, of visibility, because it was not just for, for security standpoint. And then the last item here, and this is a module I'll go through today, is, is remediating violated customers, right? Cust your customers that we can, that, that people will give you lots of reports to and say, hey, this customer is infected, violated, right? How do we clean them up? And we've got enough experience out there in the industry to know how to do, how to, how to do that. So let's now, that's the context on some of the sessions we, we covered already before we dive into sinkholes. So let's talk about sinkholes. So sinkholes is, how many people have sinkholes configured in their network? A couple of people. After this, you know, one of the things I want you guys to think about is go back and configure your sinkholes in your lab. Because this is a, this is a super powerful Swiss army knife. The core principle that a sink, the term sinkhole came out, it's not a new concept. A sinkhole is a uh, modified shunt. Now, how many people here um, ever worked on the Cisco AGS Plus router? Old on it, really. All right. Boy, this gets ages. Cisco AGS Plus, Plus router had this problem with, with uh, ACLs. It didn't do ACLs very well. And, and in certain scenarios, the ACLs would actually knock the thing down to two. So we came up with this whole trick. Ethernet AUI. Remember you had Ethernet AUI, right? We take the Ethernet AUI adapter to a coax connector and we put a T connector on it. Right? So we had a little Ethernet segment. It was basically a T connector, coax T connector. And you did a static MAC to that. So basically you had an Ethernet segment that was always on. And then you would forward packet to that. Okay? So that's a shunt. Alright? So that was a, a shunt technique. Alright? So um, so with that shunt technique, right, in 2000, when Code Red came out, or 2001 when Code Red came out, um, we were trying to figure out how to drop it. So we said, let's take it to shunt, all right? And on these conference calls with a bunch of service providers, I was trying to configure shunts and people weren't understanding, let's set up a segment of my network to do the same thing. Let's forward Code Red down a shunt, right? Let's flush it down the toilet, let's sinkhole it. And that's where the term sinkhole came out of. So all we're doing with sinkholes is taking a packet instead of trying to drop it or do an ACL, we'll pour the packet out of segment. All right? So that's the sinkhole concept, all right? So a bunch of these techniques, black hole router, tar pits, shots, sunny nets, all part of things you can put inside of a sinkhole. And the basics of this, let me go through and say it. Here's my sinkhole. Now, a sinkhole network usually is a Ethernet switch. It just starts with an Ethernet switch. It doesn't have to be a powerful Ethernet switch. Ethernet switch, just a spare Ethernet switch connected to a spare port. And you set up the router to point a static MAC to the Ethernet switch. So now you have something I can point to on the Ethernet interface, right? And so I can forward packet down that Ethernet switch. Now what happens when I forward a packet out the Ethernet switch to nowhere? A CAM is a very good device for dropping a packet. Right? Clocks in the frame, clocks it out. All right, because the whole packet goes into a frame, clock it, boom, packet's dropped. It's a very lightweight tool for dropping packets, right? So plug it, that's where you start with the Ethernet switch, because it's very easy to do it. So this sinkhole network over here could basically be an Ethernet switch with a static MAC point up to it. I can, I can send things over that way. So now over here, I got this attack. So this attack is hitting this, this particular customer. So this host is targeting. So what I'm going to do now is I advertise this. Instead of black hole it, instead of stopping it, I'm going to advertise this to the sinkhole network. The packet's going to the sinkhole network and then drops. Because the sinkhole, once the packets go in and drop it, it's on the ethernet. Now I can scan port it. Now I can put other things on it and I can look at what's going on with the packet. So remote trigger black hole, what I would do on remote trigger black hole is drop it up here 
but I have no forensics. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if the attack went away or not, because it's all dropped over here. But if I sinkhole it, right? So instead of having the attack drop here, if instead if I had the attack drop in the sinkhole, I can see when the attack goes away. I can look at the source end record. I can look at the packet type. Is it TCP? Is it UDP? Is it ICMP? Right? Are the ports rotating? Are the ports the same? Right? Are they changing addresses? Are the source addresses spoof or non spoof? I can see all that because if I drop them here, I can't see anything. If I drop it in the sinkhole, I can have devices in there that can actually figure all that stuff out. All right? So this is where this is exactly what we did with Code Red to actually look for things. So this is a tool having a sinkhole in here, but like forward and over into the sinkhole and give me a nice little you know, forensics capability over there to minimize risk with it. So in this case, this is a diagram we talked about with the code or the sinkhole slammer, because this was used as a sinkhole slammer, where I go out there and then in this case, with slammer on this worm, what we did with slammer is we told people on your sinkhole, hey, Advertise your bolt-on and dark IP space from here. Now, what's dark IP address space? Dark IP address space is that address space that has yet to be lit up on your network. So you get a slash 19 from Karen, right? So on that slash 19, you haven't turned all the slash 19 on. Now, what do we do? Well, we take the slash 19 on DDP, and we advertise the slash 19 on these edge routers. So usually what we do on these, these are my parent routers. I take the slash 19 and I put lockup routes on my edge. Okay? So I put the lockup route on my edge, and then any packet that comes in goes to null zero on my lockup route. I can't see it. Right? Well, instead of putting my lockup route on my edge, I put my lockup route here on my sinkhole. Okay? And my lockup route, instead of pointing to null zero, I point it to a static MAC on the Ethernet switch. So now, on that lockup route, anything that's not lit, right, like a worm, comes into that slash 19, and I can count it. So now I can see all the scans, all the fast scatter, coming into my dark IP space. You just turn your network, you just configure your network to be a network telescope. What did it cost you? Okay? This over here, there's a router you probably already have in your network. I connect it on a port to an Ethernet switch. On the Ethernet switch, I'll plug in spare servers on there. I, instead of having my lockup route on my edge, I put my lockup route in the middle of my network on a sinkhole. What did it cost you? I now turn my network into a telescope. I'm now using my dark IP address space to give me forensics about who's scanning my network, what is it scanning for, right? Looking for worms, looking for malware, looking for activities like that. All right, so it's taking what's already there with it, all right? So that's where a sink, sinkhole with it. So it, so we, we use this in code red, and then the worms backscatter, the telescope sort of work with it. Um, in enterprise networks, we tell we sit, teach people inside big enterprise networks. There's a couple of big enterprise networks who will go up walking around here, and they advertise their default into a sinkhole, right? They want people to use more specific, but to put default into there, right? Um, we scale this, and this is an interesting sort of technique. One, one guy, I'll give you the story of this one guy. Um, so this one guy, I convinced him, he's a big provider, and says, hey, you, you gotta try this technique out, all right? This, this is a great technique. So he, he, uh, he tries it out the first time um, on, in his lab in St. Louis, and he advertises uh, 96 slash 3. At that time, that was, uh, that was not allocated yet. 96 slash 3 wasn't allocated out there. And uh, he had two OC48 going into his lab. Okay? So he configures it to see what's going on with the 96 slash 3. He figures, oh, it'll be safe. Let me configure it and check with the configuration app. Takes down the lab. I mean, over two years, the OC48 dropped in congestion. And he goes like, first he went like, oh, this is interesting. I can see where this technique here, he's talking about the sinkhole still works. But second thing was, how come there's so much 96 mm -hmm. slash 3 traffic on my network? 96 slash 3 isn't advertised on the network yet, and I got all this destination to 96 slash 3 on my network. What the hell is going on on my network? 
right? Surprised. You know, he was surprised with it. Came to find out there was actually some customers that were using 96 Best 3 that couldn't be used 96 Best 3 and were trying to pack it back in a big sort of issue he found with it. Um, he then goes through and gets so excited about this they, that he did, went ahead and within a year deployed 25 any cast sync holes across his network on a big nationwide backbone network. And so today he's got in geographically and strategic pots across the United States 25 of these sync holes. And the ad address that he uses everywhere, each one is the same address for his single address. And he and it casts it in. And what that allows him to do is to see regional expressions. In other words, he can see which, which sinkhole does what, right, with it. And he's got the same forensic tools everywhere with it. So it's a pretty interesting system with it. So these things, they work, right? Um, Deployed correctly, you know, you have to put some preparation in there with them, right? You can start it with just one server, like this one guy, he started with just one server. With one server with, and he just did an MRTG graph with it, and that's actually from his, his graphs where he started looking with it. Um, you can use Zebra and Free, uh, FreeBSD, you know, um, you know, sort of tools on it, GNU tools, MRTG tools. What most people do is they take a, a, a router as their gateway, they take a small little router, configure an Ethernet switch in here, and they may either configure a, pat, a static MAC or put a target router in there. It all depends what sort of forensics in there goes with it. And then you put sniffers and, and analyzers, right? So you can start looking at the span ports and look at the traffic going through there. Sometimes uh, some of these boxes start becoming honey nets with it, so they'll add through it. Um, we can scan the dark IP address. If you can look for scans against dark IP addresses, the bogons, the backscatter, uh, backscatter from garbage traffic's with it. Move there. Um, when Arbor Networks was first uh, working to get out into the market, I mean, you see Arbor all over the place now, but when Arbor uh, was first uh, coming out, they were a, when they were in investment with Cisco, so I was working with them, and a lot of people were scratching their head, how do I figure out what to do with Arbor? And I, I would teach people, put a sinkhole in, so I'd have them configure a sinkhole, and then if we set the Arbor up in here, Right? And then we look for dark IP address monitoring, and they produce really nice graphics. And that helps the engineer go to their management and say, see this? This is really cool. And it just, like for instance, uh, Slammer in 2003, um, Cisco's IT department was evaluating Arbor. And the guys in the IT department, I had them deploy a sinkhole, plug the Arbor in, and Slammer, right? hit Cisco like everybody else, the Arbor alarm went off, <laughs> the ID department went in there, saw it, shut down the ports, and protected Cisco, right? And then they took the reports from Arbor and took them all the way up to John Chambers, and so here's the reports, and John says, that's a pretty graph. <laughs> and the IT department said, okay, buy, buy Arbor and deploy Arbor everywhere inside the network, right? So the pretty pictures a lot of times are really important. Right? So if you have some tool and you're trying to get your management to buy off on it and you need data to basically show it, like, you know, how do you actually get data sets without your management, you know, it's like a catch-22. I want to get this tool, but to be able to show whether the tool works or not in my network, I have to deploy it in my network. So management won't, de won't prove me to deploy it in my network unless they see what it can do. They got this catch-22. How do I get this new tool on my network, right? Sinkhole is a, is a tool where you can go out there and plug a new tool in as a trial evaluation, and you have a bunch of data going across here that has no risk impacting network. So the, you could probably get management to say, okay, throw it into the sinkhole, there's no risk to my network. Then I can see what the tool could do. All right? So so this is a, a nice nice uh, tool of it. That's actually uh, from that particular incident. Uh, chart, chart with it. You know, with the quarantine part. Um, backscatter traffic. Uh, backscatter is uh, basically traffic that um, if I attack your network with a SIN port, so I'm hitting with a SIN port, I'm using spoof addresses as a SIN port, so the packet is going back. In other words, they, they head back to the actual source that you're spoofing. Now that source could probably be part of your network. So if you're putting your lockup routes into the sinkhole, right? You basically have 
creating a mini telescope so you can see who may be spoofing your address space and using that to attack somebody else. Because you'll get that indication, the back scanner indication coming back into your network. All right? So you're able to monitor the spoofing part of it. Now, if you're not clear what that means, back in 2001, CADA did this really interesting study where they did a back scanner analysis on an entire slash eight. Right? So the San Diego State Supercomputer Center had a slash eight. And they took the whole slash eight and turned it into one of the first internet telescopes. University of Michigan and San Diego State Supercomputer did the first in our telescope work from backscatter work. Really interesting paper. And this technique is still applicable today. I'll give you an example of where this came in. This, this, it's not in this slide deck, but I'll, I'll put the slide deck up on the website. Um, when Kaminsky, the DNS Kaminsky attack a couple years ago, oh my goodness, you can swoop and poison DNS, right? And, um, you know, I work at IFC now, right? So, um, but at the time I was at Juniper, I was like, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. We're missing a piece. And because this 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 um, this looks to be very noisy, and then um, a colleague of mine who works up in Canada, he, he tried it in his lab and says, "Yeah, it's really noisy because you got all this backscatter because I'm spoofing the authority. In other words, if I tried to spoof IFC, right? If I tried to invade IFC and pretend to be IFC and poison IFC using the Kaminsky attack, then IFC, my own network, 1280." would get a whole bunch of backscatter traffic. So all I needed to do to find out that somebody's trying to poison some server somewhere in the world using the Kaminsky attack is to put NetFlow or something in front of my DNS authoritative servers and watch for backscatter traffic. So this backscatter technique, even though you know this is 2001, it's still applicable today. So the word that went out for the Kaminsky attack is anybody's really worried about Kaminsky, Put NetFlow in front of your authoritative DNS servers and look for people trying, look for backscatter traffic. You see the backscatter traffic and somebody's trying to poison you. If somebody's trying to poison you, they're trying to pretend to be you somewhere else. That means you got somebody attacking you, not on your network, but attacking somewhere else. Um, so that's, uh, some of these techniques, they, they, they you know, go, uh, they never go away. Um, so monitoring the spoof traffic, that's, that's, uh, um, you know, some, some of the techniques with it. Um, you know, this is a, you know, monitoring the spoof ranges with the slash 32s. There's a bunch out there. Um, so um, this is doing the lockup routes I talked about before. You know, instead of just having the package drop, you, you send it over to a sinkhole, right? If it's going over to the backbone router, so. Um, Worm scattering, so this is just more of it, more more applicability of, of, of using using uh, the, you know advertising dark IP address space out of it. Eric just kind of covered that, and then in any cast sinkholes, just you know placing them all over the place with the same uh, uh, IP address. And the idea there is that way the backscatter traffic. I mean the the sinkhole would go to like if this is the one I'm trying to sinkhole, it goes to the closest one. Instead of having a central point, you have to go to the closest one. So you see if there's a lot of traffic in that particular sinkhole. Then that uh, gives you an indication of that that particular region of your network is is um, is out there. Now this is something um, um, that was used twice, where a network who had a sinkhole configured was getting their backbone links attacked. In other words, what they were attacking was the point-to-point -point links on the backbone. Okay, and so. At the time, it was interesting, they, their, their particular routers that they had did not allow them to throw on a lot of ACLs, right? So this was a few years ago where the, the, the line cards were not allowed good performance on ACLs. So they were stuck in the CAT22. They're being attacked on the backbone links, they needed to do ACLs, but they didn't have enough horsepower to do the ACLs. So what do you do here? Um, you have these routing protocols on here, right, that would break. So basically, it was knocking down the links with it, right? And the ACLs, I couldn't get them in there, right? So they had a sinkhole configured. And so what we did is basically um, configured the route advertisements here. So the basically, we advertised the routes here, okay? And what that would do is, if it's a locally generated route here, okay, I'll go over the link here, right? If I'm going transit, I'm okay. 
But if I'm coming outside the outside world, I'm trying to go to this destination of 2.2's my attack. I would hit into the router. My rib would prefer this route down here. I'd go down to the sinkhole versus actually going over to the sink over here. So essentially, I use the sinkhole as a kind of filter mechanism. Because the only thing I needed to have work over here with these two addresses was a route profile. I didn't, uh, this, this traffic over here coming in, I don't need that to go in. The only thing I need going across over here is, as I showed on the last slide, whoops, was the button protocol traffic. Where this guy is. In other words, ping, OSPF, ISIS, EVRP, these are the ones that were necessary right here. All right. Um, transit traffic didn't need to actually see those addresses. All right. Now, um, they couldn't do a number on me. So it's one of those things in the middle in the middle of an attack, you don't want to do something like, let me take my point to point link and change it to a number. That would have solved the problem. Right? Um, these are some of the things to kind of think through. Um, like core hiding. Because somebody if somebody maps out your network, this was a reaction, this is using the sinkhole as a reaction tool, but if somebody maps out your network. Um, and sees all these addresses in there, they can attack it. All right? So core hiding as edge protection, this is part of backbone protection, is, is think through, you know, should the customer see this? Some people say, oh yeah, let's allow, allow the customers to see those addresses that are going to be traced up. And some people say, what, what information does that really give somebody to see those trace routes for us? So. And that's our sinkholes. Any questions on... Uh, IHC 1280 right now, we don't have a sinkhole configured yet. We are getting a sinkhole configured. Because we got guys who want to deploy uh, Honeyant. And so we're going to take uh, our Honeyant and we'll plug it into a sinkhole. Right? Perfect tool. So that's another thing, nice thing about sinkholes is there's, you know, what's the cost to get a Honeyant loaded? You download it, you get extra servers. Right? So again, this is another example where, um, you know, you're not going out there buying a whole bunch of, of capital equipment to actually do really significant changes to the network that make your network more secure and to see what's going on in the bad guy, in the bad guy operation, right? It's, it's using open source, uh, spare equipment, configurations on your gear, right? Um, and some of these configurations on your gear are the sort of configurations that, you know, are things that are pretty reasonable for doing a rollout plan to get across the network. You're not going to be one of those things where your bosses will say, well, that's insane. I'm not going to authorize you to configure that across my network. These are pretty rational sort of things to configure to get across your network. Okay. So this is, let's talk about uh, remediation. Um, there is an internet draft out there. Um, called Recommendations for Remediation of Bots and ISP Networks. It's in Box 12 City, I think, right now, right? Does it help? You don't? You haven't been tracking? I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> He's one of the co-authors. No. No? <laughs> um, so, um, uh, basically, uh, what we had learned over the last, since around 2005, there's a several big providers um, who are around here, and some of the guys will talk to you about it, um, who have been doing remediation. In other words, remediation is where, you know, this, this guy over here gets infected, you know, he's a residential customer, and then I get notified that he's infected, and uh, remediation is the stuff that, that I let him know somehow. I help him out to get infected, right? And for years, we used a, a social health, a public health model, kind of like right out of the World Health Organization to say, he's infected, right? He's actually quarantine him, right? And we came up certain tools with it. Today, over the last year, we've been shifting and saying, he's, it's not that he's infected, we're saying that he's violated. He's been criminalized. I mean, he's been, the criminal has been a victimizing this guy, right? Because he's, it's, it's not the one of those things where some guy's installing malware on his system just to play around with him. Installing malware to like steal his identity, to steal his credit card, to steal his bank account, 
uh, to be used his computer in his home to actually attack other people, right? It's like the drug gang moving into your house, attacking other people. So we treat him as not as a somebody who's infected. We're treating him as somebody who's been victimized. And if you treat him as somebody who's been victimized, then we have a responsibility to do something, right? So what's going on right now in different countries, the United States is one of them, but the FCC, is we're figuring out what should we do as backbone providers that's cost effective to help out our customers who are being victimized, right? And that's what remediation is all about. This is a collection of recommendations going through an IETF on there, and this is a presentation that kind of walks through all that. So first principle on this is your customers aren't the problem. Your customers are being victimized, right? And if you do this right, if you think through this, um, the evidence from the people who have been doing this, the providers who have been doing this, Comcast is very loud on this. If you come to the security box, the security section uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon, this time tomorrow afternoon, uh, Comcast will be up there on stage. It's actually our, our, our customer churn is going down because of this, and the customer report is going up because of the way we notify. Because we treat our customers as being victimized, and we're helping them out, and our customers appreciate us helping them. All right. So the general consensus for people who start doing this is that the customers are positively responding to this. Right. So um, and they're helping out with this. The semantic data. Here's another data set from the semantic study. And I highly encourage people to go and look at this report um, of the survey they did. But their estimates are showing over a million around the world, a million new victims a day. A million new victims a day being victimized of people with this malware activity. There's a lot of malware activity going out there, right? You know, every minute, 820 victims every minute, you know, 14 victims every second, right? So like the way they calculate down. Every day there are twice as many cybercrime victims as new baby born, right? So there's a lot of cybercrime going out there, people being victimized. So if you think of that way. So what we're trying to do with remediation is we're trying, here's usually guy, the malware guy, he create, he does create the malware, he activates it, he does the replication, gets it in, out there affected, then he victimizes somebody, then, then we discover it. Then we discover the guy's been victimized, this guy's been victimized, then I discover it, and then we work on eradicating. What we're trying to do with remediation techniques is shortcut this whole thing, where if we are looking for, we can discover it before the guy's been victimized and notify them, so before the credit card gets stolen, before the computer gets used for malicious activity, go out there and start um, remediating. This is the hope. And there are certain providers out there, CenturyLink is one of them. CenturyLink has talked here at the Denver NANOG during the security block. And I don't, I don't know who from CenturyLink here, was here this time, but they will tell you, here's how we've been doing it at Quest. There's Quest, now CenturyLink. So here's how we've been doing it for years, and we'll actually walk you through uh, their technique to how they've been doing it, and, and basically do the shortcut. They will. They pull in all the forensics data, see it, and put it into the walled garden systems and able to remediate quite effectively uh, to basically you know, clean up on their network. They have really pretty good infect, uh, cleanup rates across the network, right? Um, so another principle with it is that no one party can clean this up. So in other words, there are people say, oh, the service provider should do all this. You can't. Service providers, all of us in here who are background providers, we have a role to play, but we can't do it ourselves, right? In other words, we have a role to play, but we can't solve the problem. So people say the service provider should do all this and solve the problem. Service provider can't solve the problem. Service provider is just one component of a remediation ecosystem. It's one piece of the puzzle, right? A necessary piece, a piece that, you know, Guidelines are going to say, hey, all you guys should do your role, but operating systems got to do their role, end environment's got to do their role, the customer's got to do their role, everybody's the application guy's got to do their role, everybody's got to do that got a part to play. And the service part has just got a piece of the puzzle, not a, you know, can't solve the problem. So so don't don't expect to solve the problem. Somebody says, oh, you guys can solve the problem. Say, no, we can't solve the problem. We're just a piece of the puzzle, right? So that's that's a, the, the role with it. Um, the other thing with this is there's no way you can guarantee you can eliminate malware. If your system, I'm sorry, second idea, but your system gets infected 
right? Um, there isn't a tool I can give you to clean it up. You take like DNS changer, we're talking about DNS changer. The big problem we have with DNS changer cleaning up is it is a boot sector infection. It's a boot sector infection that there is no cleanup tool. We haven't got a cleanup tool for it. So what is the recommendation that your system's got DNS changer on it? Reformat. Boot sector reformat. Oh, well, what about my data? Oh yeah, I need to back it up. But you should use a backup set before you got infected. But I'm infected. Um, right, so now, all right, now you go into the catch 22. How do you clean up your system? Right? So being a changer is an example, one of those things where the bad guys, you know, get ingrained in the system that, you know, some of this stuff is, is getting, uh, you know, really tight. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a warning as you get more and more devices. You know, this thing, yeah, there's a LAN port on this. This is a network device, right? If there was a, you know, one of the sections, those of you on the first section missed on, is, is cyber criminals, they go after the money. If there was money for me to inject an in-focus projector, right, that I can make money off of it as a cyber criminal, then I would infect it. Now, how do I clean it up then? Right, go to info, you know, how do, okay, what do I, how do I, how do I reboot this? Um, how do I do a low-level reformat of it in focus? I don't know, right? And this is the future world we're going into as the home gets wired and wired and wired and organizations get wired and wired. This guy can plug into the ethernet and if it gets infected, or maybe it's running uh, Windows, right? So we saw like Tom Picker getting medical devices, Tom Picker malware and medical devices. So, so the funniest thing I ever heard was this thing here. Um, for a cleanup, um, this, this was um, you know a CTO in Hong Kong, <laughs> and we were talking about what do you guys, what do you do when, when somebody calls up and they they got computer infected with malware? He says, oh, you just tell them go buy a new computer. We're in Hong Kong. <laughs> he said, well, what what do they do with old computers? <laughs> oh, they put it in the market, they reformat the drives, and they sell them. <laughs> so it's it's a cost-effective way. You turn in your old computer, they reformat the hard drive, hopefully, <laughs> and then they go out there and and, and do that. So that was a, a funny thing that they did with it. Um, so detecting botnets, um, we can see malware on, on networks. Like you take the same cold technique, you take NetFlow, you take Blum Cleaning Network, you, know, you, you, can, you can find it yourself. But you don't, you know, that may take time. If you don't have your network set up to do all that right now, don't worry, okay? Because there's a whole bunch of organizations. So this list over here, which is listed in the draft, the internet draft, all these organizations will give you feeds for free. You want feeds? Like for instance, Path to DNS, anybody here, Path to DNS, you want Path to DNS? Come talk to IFT, that's the, the S S SIE part, that's our part. Atlas, Hungary, is part of NSPSEC, they give you a report every day, <laughs> right? Shadow servers, free, you set it up. You take your network lock, you take your autonomous system number, you talk to Shadow Server to make sure that you are the owner. So they say, okay, you're the owner. Larry's the owner, so you've got the owner. And then Shadow Server, who collects a whole bunch of information on malware information, will send you a daily report. Here's a report. Here's who's infected on your network. Okay? So there are a bunch of organizations here. Spam House will tell you who's infected. Deal Shield will tell you who's infected. Right? Costs you nothing. Cost you email, right? Set up a mail list. At IFT, we got a mail list for these reports to go into a mail list. So all our knock guys, you know, they come into a mail list. So that's how we, we manage it for us. So what did it cost to IFT? It cost us an alias. And people sign up for the alias, right? So again, these guys are already doing the legwork. They're collecting it. Now what do you do with it? So now I get a report in and this guy is infected, right? So I can get the reports to infect it. So what do I do? How do I contact them, all right? Well, basics of business 101. This guy's my customer, right? And if you're my customer, hmm, um, I need to be able to contact you. I need to be able to bill you. I need to be able to call you up, right? I should have your phone number. Um, if you're a mobile provider, you mobile operation, I can SMS. I can have SMSs for my mobile provider, right? Um, I get alerts. I'm on Comcast. I get alerts on the screen. 
right? Pay your bills. <laughs> now, right? So this is all normal. Having a tight communication channel to my customer is normal, right? It's normal part of business operations, right? So security notification alerting violated customers is I'm already doing this stuff, right? It's the customer loyalty is all, all, all there. I'm just looking at how to exploit these little channels. So like an email notification, I can send an email message. So I send you an email, hey, your computer's infected. Oh, wait a minute. You're saying, how do I know it came from IFC? This guy could be spoofing Barry, right? I gotta, so, so this is where you kind of got to think things through to the notification. So how does the end user know that I'm not being spoofed? Well, you can call this phone number, which is our help desk, or you can use this landing page that we've set up. That how do you clean up your system, right? Um, I can call you and say, hey, uh, your computer's infected. And he goes like, well, who are you? You're, you're calling me at dinner time. Who are you? He says, well, you know. So you have to have some way to say, please go to this website or check this email or check the, the postal notification I sent you, right? It says you can send a postal notification, right? Your computer is infected, right? Do an illegal letter. Hey, we saw your computer's infected. We recommend you go to this site and help get cleaned up, right? It's prompting the things to, to get activation with it. Wall garden notification, right? You go to Starbucks, and I'll, I'll point this out. You go to Starbucks. What happens when you go to Starbucks? You have to click yes at the wall garden. You know, back in 2005, we were all scratching ahead whether it should work or not when Quest was first doing it. We now know it works very well, and everybody's used to it. You, your customers are used to doing wall gardens, right? Instant messages. I mean, my kids, my, you know, didn't, you, know, you think of how do you get to the teenagers and say your computer's infected? Well, you know, my daughter lives on IM, you know, Google Talk. Okay, well, you know, you have to analyze your customers. How do you get across to them? Maybe you go to a web page and pop up in the chat window and chat with them, right? So as soon as, as, soon as they, they log in the net, you try to pop, do a pop-up and chat with them, right? Uh, SMS messages, web browsers, social media, right? Um, web browser notification and, and, and social media part of it, right? Um, there's certain places that you probably don't want to try to do notifications. Like, for instance, uh, uh, internet cafes. Who's infected, right? It just may not be worth it on an internet cafe because people are transiting back and forth in and out. Um, shared IP addresses, which is basically all your customers because they're all behind NATS, and NATS are all over the place, right? So how do you how do you how do you take care of that part? Um, you know how many people have um, you know how do you remediate a refrigerator? <laughs> how do you remediate an Xbox? How do you remediate a uh, set top box? How do you remediate um, a uh, diabetic monitoring device? This this is this is why we need to start working on this stuff that we need now because it's going to get harder and harder, right? Um, uh, Colleague of mine, uh, Donnie Joffrey, right, works over at Newstar, when we were doing the contractor working group, because we're on the contractor working group together, it's a big worm that's still six million strong out there on the net, um, we noticed that there was a whole bunch of medical hospitals popping up. And we actually tracked it down and found out there was a whole bunch of medical devices infected with contractor. And still today, there's a whole bunch of medical devices infected with contractor. <laughs> right? How do you clean up the medical devices? And him talking to those companies, trying to say, what do you mean malware is on our device? Well, what do you use it? We're using Windows. Uh, how old Windows? Well, we're using this Windows for like 10 years ago or something like that, right? It's just, it's a device. They say, well, why, why should that matter to us? They, they have no idea because their focus has been, here's the medical test thing. They're, they're all about the medical test, not the underlying operating system. But yet they get infected as a collateral impact. Um, and also talking to your customers, if you think of them like, okay, you've been victimized. And how I talk to you, law enforcement has a lot of lessons learned. Because if I call you up as a customer and say, hey, you've been victimized. You know, your credit card's used phone things like this. We've got to help you get your computer cleaned up. Can you go to this website and start working on it? If I treat you as a victim, you're not a problem. You're a victim. Then what happens and what the evidence is showing for the people, the operators who are doing this now, is that the customers respond positively. They go like, oh, wow, these guys care about me. My provider cares about me. Customer loyalty goes up, right? So there's enough evidence out there that says this sort of action, take action to notify your customers and say you've been victimized and let us help you do something about it is paying off. It's actually, there's, a, there's not really a negative to it. 
And there's not really a cost, big cost thing with it, because some of the notification techniques are things that don't cost money. But then you run into these things. You know, <laughs> customer says, I checked all my computers, my kids' computers, my phone, my tablets, my Xbox, my TiVo, my printers, my furnace, my light controls, my home security system, my healthcare monitoring system, my electric vehicle charging system, my solar panel monitoring system. I packed everything, fixed everything, you still saying I'm putting them out of it. I checked in my house. I thought everything was wired at my house. <laughs> There's a lot of things wired at my house. It's like, um, you know, um, and I don't know if I'm checking the malware right now or not, but see, that could be, you know, support team say, hey, have you checked to see if your neighbors are using your wireless? And I have to go like, hmm, I have to think about that because my wireless network is set up with a check. I got a Mac system with four distribution points around my house, and of course my neighbors can pick up and sign up to the green check network, right? And so I could get a call from Comcast and say, we got an infected computer on your on your on your system, and I'm going to have to check the wireless to find out: is it my neighbor's computer? Is my neighbor's kid's computer? Is it my neighbor's refrigerator? Connect on my wireless, right? Um, as our as our, our you know this remediation part can be thick, and this is um, you laugh at that, but um, uh, we talked to some of the guys at Quest that have been doing this for quite a number of years, and they say um, you know they'll get a significant a number of of people who are their customers who never knew that their neighbors were actually using them as the access point for their whole community, even if their neighbors had their own Quest account. They just didn't have things configured or using the neighbor's house versus their house. And there's it's, it's interesting statistics that they would, would figure out what they what they do this stuff with. Um, there's a bunch of solutions out there behind the scenes. And what's interesting right now as we're, we're stepping things up in industry how uh, companies like you know Quest or now CenturyLink and Cox would actually say, please talk to us. Comcast says, please talk to us. So anybody here as I'm talking about this and saying, hmm, I think we need to start thinking about this. You can go talk to your bosses and say, I think we need to talk think about this. Well, what you can do is email me, and I'll do the email introductions to you know the other people who are doing it now, who have been doing it for quite a number of years, and say, hey, they like to talk. And you'll be amazed when you start talking to, you know, the Central Bank, the Cox, the Colts, the British Telecom, the, you know, these guys who've been doing it for quite a while, how much information you'll get from them. Here's how we did things. Here's the lessons we learned. Here's the techniques we used. We tried this technique, and then we tried this technique. We did this, and we did that. And you go like, wow, those are reports coming with a lot of information. Why? Because it's in our own collective best interest. Because you take CenturyLink, Right? And an infected computer on your network is an infected computer that can impact a century link customer. It's in our collective interest to help each other with these solutions here. Right? So so that's that's why they will help. That's why this when I talk about the private product collaboration making a big difference, that's why it makes a big difference. That's why it makes a big difference to come here. So those of you who are having problems with your management saying, Well, I don't know if I should send you to NetOff, you say, This is what I do at NetOff. See, because of Nanog, we're having this conference call with our peers, with these other people out there, figuring these things out. So I need to go to the next Nanog. <laughs> so I can work on the next thing, right? That's the secret. So if you want to keep on coming back for a Nanog, work with your peers, and then after this session, after when you come back, set up the calls afterwards so your boss will say, this is why I sent you to Nanog, because you're coming back and we're getting some stuff done, right? So, so that's kind of important with this. And this is just uh, wall gardens. We see them all over the place now, right? The customers are used to it. Now, remediation guidelines, when you tell a customer that says, hey, you're infected, what should you do then? And unfortunately, we only have three things. One is self-help, which is probably, you know, 90% of the time is self-help. Say, you're infected, please go to this website and get cleaned up. You're infected, please go to Microsoft slash security and get cleaned up. You're infected, please go to Apple slash security and get cleaned up. It's self-help is the key thing with it. But you'd be amazed. I mean, you take a uh, higher friend uh, two years ago and uh, their computer, they say, oh, our computer's really slow because it's probably infected. And it took me two days to clean the thing up. I had to re-back it up. I had, you know, basically taken a USB stick with it. There were six different pieces of malware on that thing. Six pieces of malware on that thing, right? Because the malware stack up. One bad guy will grab it, and the next bad guy will grab it, and then you know they'll stack up on it, right? 
So South Elf is 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 um, is tough. So this is where there's several companies who are teaming up with professional help. Right? Go to the store. Go to the you know computer guy store, or go to Best Buy, or uh, sign up with Maccabee or Symantec or things like that. Right? Um, I use my mom as like the, the used to use my mom as a horror story because um, uh, back in 2004 that we were talking about this problem and the cost of this problem <coughs> at a man out here and um, BJ Gill who was at AOL at the time was up on stage and we we're talking about the problem with it and um, I was basic my mom who was an AOL user got infected and myself and my brother went around and so she got on the phone with AOL and spent 10 hours on the phone with AOL cleaning up her computer because of infection. Uh, last year, she spent uh, six hours with Symantec because she used Northern Antivirus, Symantec Antivirus, I don't know. And she spent six hours with them on the phone. Didn't cost her anything. You know, I don't know how, I don't know how Symantec's making money off of that now, but you know. But, <laughs> but see, that's professional help. So you can do partnerships and alliances that for professional help. Or, and you can also get a new computer and device. Right, what do you what do you what do you do when you got this stuff out there? Now the consequences is of not doing something is is the consequences are starting to roll in the rest. Um, everything from the Australia I code to what's going on in FCC, what's going on in the European Union, um, to what's going on in parts of China, what's going on around in different parts of the world. Civic society, cyber civic society is stepping up and say people need to do something. And as the risks start to get quantified, when people start seeing how much theft is happening. People go like, oh my goodness, something needs to happen. So that's why we do these sessions at NANOG. That's why we do security sessions at NANOG. That's why we have the blue dots this time. It's because we need to do things with it, right? So it's not just the market forces and civil legal actions. There are guidelines that are going to come across. And then especially when the underwriters come, come, come through with it. So homework and asking you guys is, you know, we pull up this internet graph, read through it. It's in last call right now. You see something, it needs to be there. Probably you're out of state right now. Just say, hey, we can do another internet class, other guidelines. Um, other part of the homework on here, you know, as we wrap up tonight, if anybody here who wants to really get involved with doing security has to come talk, talk to me. I can plug you into the community, plug you into each other. Um, the wiki that we're going to be setting up here, I'll put this web page up here as, as we leave so you can see the confluence.org. Um, all these slides, that you see are going to be up there in PowerPoint version, in PDF version, and more. In other words, what we're doing is we're dusting off the work from several years ago. It's a little bit, um, you know, we didn't have anybody, one person in charge of it, and we're pulling it all together. So Medica Kale, who was her, here earlier, her and I are actually working to pull together all the certified security knowledge base we have into one site, one location, right? And we work on this collaboratively, so you're going to see a lot of interesting things with it. Um, the Nanog, the Rice, the Apricots, the Sanog, groups like that, we're going to be having sessions in it. Um, and we'll work on deploying more, because the more we deploy, 